Once I was lost in sin's dark, lonely valley, an empty soul and straying far from God. And then one day I met the blessed Savior. I trusted him. Okay, now we're going to get into Acts chapter 8. And in Acts chapter 8, now we've been talking about the Christian life from birth to eternity. And we have covered uh, what happens whenever I get saved. And we've also talked about my identity in Christ and specifically eternal security. It's very easy uh, to, to see eternal security whenever you start talking about the identity that we have in Jesus Christ. Last week we went into a lot of types in the Old Testament of what it looked like for New Testament salvation. And uh, we wa- talked about Abraham, and we talked about, uh, who else did we talk about? Uh, Rebecca and Isaac, and we talked about uh, several other types in the Scripture, and they're all throughout the Old Testament. All throughout the Old Testament. All throughout the Old Testament, uh, there was a preacher one time that all he could preach on was the gospel. And he preached on the gospel uh, on Sunday morning and on Sunday night and on Wednesday night. And whenever he first became the pastor of the particular church, uh, the deacon said, okay, man, this guy really goes over the gospel. And every single time he was preaching about the gospel. And he would see the gospel in, all through Genesis, from Genesis 1-1, whenever Adam and Eve uh, first sinned and God gave them the coat of, of, uh, of a sheep, of a coat of a lamb. And uh, they took that blood and shed that blood in order to take and cover their nakedness. And he would preach on uh, the gospel there. And he would go all the way to Exodus. He would talk about the blood of the lamb on the door. And before long, the church just got really tired of hearing about the gospel. Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Finally, the deacons came to him and said, Pastor, could you teach on something else? And so he would begin to teach on something else or preach on something else. And we'll always bring him back to the gospel because he saw it all throughout the Old Testament. And the New Testament. He talked about the gospel and the gospel. And finally, the deacons came to him and said, Hey, guys, we've got to get together and we've got to give the pastor some sort of idea here and get him off of this subject of the gospel. And so they came together and they said, Pastor, we got a topic for you that we want you to preach on. We know that Luke was a physician and we want you to preach on medicine because they thought maybe medicine would get him off the topic of the gospel. And so he comes to the pulpit that Sunday morning. He says, the deacons have asked me to preach on medicine. He says, I want to tell you, there's all kinds of pills that you can take. There are aspirin pills, and there are pills to get you from an upset stomach. But this morning, I want to talk to you about the gospel. (laughs) And he preached on the gospel. (laughs) And the reason why is because the gospel is all throughout the Old Testament. And you can see New Testament salvation in its type all throughout the Old Testament, all the way to our redeeming way in the New Testament of being baptized into the body of Jesus Christ and being sealed away from your body and spirit, or excuse me, sealed with the Holy Spirit and being uh, circumcised away from your flesh in the spiritual operation that God has given us. And the identity that we have in Christ makes it impossible to believe anything else other than we are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Now, I know there are all kinds of verses out there that probably are going through some of your heads, and you're thinking to yourself, what about this verse, and what about this verse, and what about Hebrews chapter 6, and what about this right here, and this right here? And I know there are all those kind of verses out there. And we tried uh, several months ago to go about, whenever we talked about the interpretation of Scripture and the, the applications of Scripture, doctrinal and spiritual applications of Scripture. But that's not what our class is about. We're just doing the basics. We're doing the Christian life. Okay? We're not doing uh, problem texts, if you will. So we talked about what happens when I get saved, and we have uh, beat a dead horse whenever it comes to eternal salvation and can I be unsaved or lose my salvation. And we got a few more things to say about that as time goes by. But today we're going to talk about water baptism. Okay? So the second thing that you would ever teach any convert, of course the first thing you ever teach a convert, is what happens whenever they get saved. And you don't have to go into as much depth as... Uh, my identity in Christ. But you do need to go a little bit into it of what happens when a person gets saved, just to make sure that they did get saved. Okay, If you're discipling someone, you would go to them and you would say, okay, let's review Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you do that, sir or ma'am? 
And if they are sure of their salvation and you go through and you say, okay, well, this is your identity in Jesus Christ. Usually I take them over to 1 John where it says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Usually I take them over to the verses like that so that they can understand that whenever a person has believed on Jesus Christ, they can know that they have eternal life. Usually I take them over to John 10, 28 and 29, where Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And I go through that, and I tell them, Jesus Christ has got you in his hand, and you're never going to get out. And so I go through the surface, you know, Acts, or whenever uh, 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 Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I take that new convert over there to them, and I show them you have confidence that you can live life without having to worry about your salvation. So that they understand that there is a motivation, yes, I show that them later, for living for Jesus Christ, but they can be confident in their salvation. But then the second thing that you show any new convert is, it's time to take the second step. The second step is water baptism. Okay? So we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to start delving into that. Number one, there is a basic command in Matthew chapter 28. And hopefully you know the Great Commission. I hope some of you know it by heart. But Matthew chapter 28, this is the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, this is talking to the disciples, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now this is what we term as the Great Commission. That is... They committed, the Lord committed to our trust, to the disciples' trust, to go forth and to preach the gospel. In Matthew chapter 16, he says, go and preach to every creature. And so whenever I was a kid, I used to practice preaching the gospel to my dog. So I don't think I was real biblical, but that's, I use that verse anyway. But, uh, that, but uh, you're supposed to go and preach it to every person around. God wants us to preach it across the world. And after they believe, then they are supposed to be baptized. So it's a basic command, and it's good enough to know that it is a command. It's good enough. For any new convert, we ought to be able to say, this is a command of the Lord. We are to go and to preach the gospel, and then you, sir or ma'am, are supposed to be baptized. But then that comes along, and it starts rearing its questions, especially later on whenever you go through a discipleship program. What in the world does good does it do to go get your feet down into the water and get baptized or put under the water. What is that for? That's what it's, that, that's the questions that arise in your mind. Anybody else had that question other than me? I know you have because I teach other converts these questions and they ask the question. One of the things that they ask is, what in the world is baptism for? If it's not for your salvation, what is it for? So that's kind of what we're going to delve into. Now, there are some examples of this. Jesus said to his disciples specifically, I want you to go, I want you to preach the gospel, and then I want you to tell, or excuse me, I want you to baptize those people. Okay? So we can look back at the disciples and say, well, what did they understand it to mean? Okay? So Acts chapter 2 was the first one. And I've got this one on the board. Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. He says, Then they that gladly received his word, and this is the first time Peter actually preaches the gospel to a group of people, a bunch of Jews, living there inside of Jerusalem, and many that were from about and around the region, all over the world, Jewish people, Jewish men and women, there with their sons, all celebrating Pentecost. And Peter stands up and preaches the gospel to them, and it says, Then they that gladly received his word, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Okay? They didn't get baptized until they received his word. Let's look at another one. Um, we actually have three more, but look at Acts chapter 8, and we'll end it on this one this morning. I don't have time to go too much into the rest of them. But Acts chapter 8, verse number 12, okay? Verse number 12. The Bible says, and this is Philip preaching, and but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. When did they get baptized? When they believed. Everybody see that? 
Okay? It's even described even further for us in Acts chapter 8, verse number 26. And so we're going to go for verse 26 all the way through verse number 38. It's a great story here. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So it's not clear there whether he's talking about the Candace came to, the, to uh, Jerusalem to worship or this Ethiopian eunuch came to worship, but he was obviously there. Now, verse 28 says, He, that is the, the Ethiopian eunuch, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Okay? He's reading the book of Isaiah. Verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot, this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he was come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. When was the Ethiopian eunuch baptized? After he believed. Does everybody see that? Okay. After he believed. So whenever the, the gospel is preached to someone and they believe, then they can be baptized. Okay. Let's look at another example. And I realize that thing went off there, but let's look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We could see it over and over and over again throughout the uh, Word of God. We're only going to look at three or four instances. But Acts chapter 10, and this is uh, Peter, and he's speaking to a Gentile. He's speaking to Cornelius. And the reason why I'm showing you... Okay. And in Acts chapter 10, verse number 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them, talking about the Gentile Italians, which heard the word. Okay. And they of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed, were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? When did they receive the Holy Ghost? Before or after baptism? Before. Okay? Now, I'll tell you, whenever a person gets the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, that means they got saved. Now, it says right here, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So the people that received his word, where it says right in verse number uh, uh, 44, While Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And then the Holy Ghost falls on them. They believe what Peter said, and then they were allowed to be baptized. So that's the types brought about in the New Testament of the way that the Jews or the apostles believed that God was bringing about this thing we call water baptism. Now, what we're going to do next week is we're going to come back along and we're going to say, okay, there's, remember what we do with this particular uh, series is we're going to take the basics, we're going to scratch the surface, we're going to show it like we would a new convert, okay, to help you, and then we're going to take and we're going to do a deep dive into it. So next week, we're going to talk about the law of first mention in Scripture and find out where water baptism is. In the Old Testament, we had all kinds of types of salvation, didn't we? In the Old Testament, it's all through. All, to, all through the Old Testament, all kinds of types of salvation. 
Where's the, where's the type of water baptism in the Old Testament? Noah. You, we can say Noah, but Noah was in a boat, right? Well, who said, Brother Jason? Red Sea. There's a good type of water baptism in the Old Testament. You go, how in the world is the Red Sea a type of the Old Testament? Right? All kinds of, uh, of little things that we can point to. How about uh, uh, Naaman? You better remember the story of Naaman and Elisha? Well, that's right. Go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times. There's a type in the Old Testament. But boy, it sure just doesn't line up as clear as what you would like in the Old Testament. So we're going to talk a little bit about the law of first mention next week. We're going to talk about John's baptism and, and Jesus' baptism, get into some pretty uh, remarkable things to help solidify what water baptism is for. Okay? And if you've ever had a question in your mind whether water baptism had to do with uh, salvation, we're going to hopefully try to clear that up next week. Okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be dismissed this morning. Thank you again, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, and I pray, the Lord, that you'd help us to understand and when we read what the Word of God says. I pray that you help us also to believe and come to it with a believing heart. I pray, O oh Lord, that you bless us now as we go into the services. I pray that you get glory to yourself through everything that is said and done. And I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit be with us as we lift up our voices in thanks and praise to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. And I shall live eternally because he came to set the captive free. Amen.